I kind of compare it with being at a giant dog park. Some of them love it. Like you start giving them armpit scratches and they're just like giant dogs. They just start rolling around and they're flying all around you. But these animals are huge. People are intimidated by them, but once you, once you learn their behavior, they're just right into you right away. They just look at you like a big chew toy. I could never see myself living anywhere other than the Pacific Northwest. I could literally spend every single day the rest of my life and never travel anywhere other than Vancouver Island, and I would still never have enough time to see this whole place. My first introduction to the ocean would have definitely come from my mom. She's me with the sea lion right there. Later on in life, I realized that it is a pretty unique experience to get to go out and spend time with these animals on a regular basis. Sea lions are a large, intelligent animal, and they're very sensitive of what your intentions are and, and how they choose to interact with you is totally their choice. If you're comfortable and, and they're inquisitive, they'll come and they'll chew on your fins or they come up and they chew on the edge of your mask or give you big kisses on the lips or big hugs. They wrap your, their fins around you and give you a big hug. People get sketched out about it. Like I've had lots of people contact me and be like, don't you think those things are aggressive? Just because an animal's putting its mouth on you doesn't mean it's doing it in a harmful way. They don't have hands, they can't explore their world with anything other than their mouth. There's people that spend now a lot of money to travel to the other side of the planet to watch a group of large migratory animals in Africa or something say, and here I can just go out on my boat and it's not something I take for granted at all anymore, having the opportunity to do this. If you're afraid of coming down and, and going and swimming in the ocean because of sharks, you should be terrified to make a piece of toast. 400 people died last year from defective toasters, whereas less than 10 did from sharks. This is the first large shark expedition like this in the Western Gulf. We'll be tagging hammerhead sharks, tiger sharks, and mako sharks trying to understand how they're leveraging the Gulf in their birthing, mating, and full migratory patterns. We'll be getting up every day just before dawn. The fishing team will be going out, getting all of our lines rigged and ready to go. And then we'll get the ship in position with a lift in the water. And we'll be looking to capture, bring sharks back to the lift, lift them up out of the water. And once we do that, a whole team of scientists from a half dozen institutions will circle around the shark and we'll conduct 12 research projects in about 15 minutes, then release the shark and open source the tracking to the world so that everyone can follow it. What we're finding is that these massive sharks have huge, huge movements across the ocean. We have one of these white sharks, Lydia, who's traveled over 35,000 miles in just two years. Very, very regular for these sharks to be swimming 1,000 miles a month, which is why it's so important to figure out where they go we're losing 200,000 sharks a day for shark fin soup, 100 million a year. You know, people need to understand an ocean with no sharks means an ocean with no fish. They are the lion, the balance keeper of the ocean. And if they are not there, the whole food chain collapses. This is a simple battle. We gotta solve the puzzle of these sharks' lives to make sure they flourish and make a difference for the future. A narwhal's horn is actually an enlarged tooth, and not a horn at all. And today, we're talking about narwhals, unicorns of the sea. Nice shirt. Thanks. My grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, studied and explored the Earth's ocean. I do too, and our submarine is in Arctic waters searching for the narwhal. Oh, he's a beauty. 
A narwhals can grow up to 17 feet in length, and their front tooth can grow up to 10 feet in length. It's the only straight tusk in the world. Now, typically, these are only found on males, and are actually full of up to 10 million nerve endings, helping the narwhal detect pressure, and salt levels, and even temperature in the water. Here's an interesting fact. A narwhal tusk is flexible. It can bend about one foot in any direction without breaking. It was originally thought that these tusks were for dueling, but a new theory suggests they're for attracting a mate. Narwhals don't migrate like other whale species. They spend their entire lives in icy arctic waters hunting squid, fish, and crab. If you want to see one live, you'll have to come up north because narwhals don't thrive in captivity. Rather, they die. Some animals we humans just can't tame. To be able to be doing science while you're out there on a surfboard, surfing down the face of a wave, it's just such a fleeting moment, it's incredible to actually be able to do it. Smartfin is a surfboard fin. You clip it on the bottom of your board, and you go out for your surf session. It has technology that measures ocean pH, salinity, ocean temperature and very detailed wave characteristics. So there will be an enormous amount of data. The reason these parameters are important is because they are shifting directly as a result of climate change. We have detailed information about the deep ocean, but very limited, accurate information about the near shore. Satellites can't be really accurate with data in that narrow zone. And the other way is ocean buoys, and they're just not deployed at the coast. Bingo, SmartFin can fill that gap. Collecting oceanic data is a very time-consuming, expensive process. This is like, you just need to know how to surf. The data moves from your fin to your phone via Bluetooth, and then from your phone it goes up to our servers where everything's processed. I had to develop sensors that don't affect the surfboard. Nobody's gonna surf a fin that is not a standard foil. Aside from that LED right there that's blinking that tells you that there's like some sort of technology in there, you wouldn't know the difference. So we've got a test tank set up now and we're just trying to look at the precision and accuracy of the um, instrument itself. Things are looking pretty promising. As a scientist, it's pretty exciting to be able to get data over these different time and space scales. I mean, the fact that you can go out and surf and contribute to understanding what's actually happening out there is incredible. I'm not a surfer. I know nothing about surfing. I know I look like a surfer, but um, I'm not. Surfers are very influential and care deeply about the environment and want to be talking about it. So SmartFin is just a tool to do that in a more concrete way. Coral is kind of like the trees of a forest. They're just the backbone of a whole tropical ecosystem. And if they disappear, we're in a lot of trouble. My name is Ken Niedemeyer. I'm the founder of the Coral Restoration Foundation. The reason I'm doing this, I was, I've been growing up diving, spent a lot of time in the water. One, two, three. I basically watched the coral reefs dying. As the reefs died, the fish didn't come back, and I realized I'm tired of watching it die. I need to do something about it. And so I developed this whole idea of growing corals in an offshore nursery and replanting them on the reef. So you're kind of like a farmer? I'm a farmer. <laughs> a 
Yeah, we grow corals just like a farm. There's a good time of the year to plant and there's a harvest time and we have five offshore nurseries in the Keys. Each tree can hold a hundred corals. We start with little fragments that we collect and after six to nine months, maybe a year, that fragment has turned into a colony that might have a hundred centimeters of growth on it. We cut that off and then we plant it out on the reef. So we just harvested some corals and we're going to take them out to Pickles Reef right now and plant them. We've got a couple thousand of them out there that we've already planted and we're going to add some more. It is a, a bit of gardening when you put the corals back out on the reef. You're saying, oh, I think that would look nice over there and that one would look nice over there. And some of it's based on what used to be there and what should be there and that's how we do our planting. We planted 20,000 already this year. We'll plant 25,000 next year. Those corals will probably spawn next year. Part of the long range goal is get the corals reproducing on their own. I'm excited every time I get in the water, whether I'm going to work in the nursery or whether I'm planting corals or just looking for new areas to plant. A lot of people said, oh, you can never do that. It'll never work. Can't do it on a big enough scale. And I think I've proven that it can be done. And if we can train enough people and teach enough people in other places, I think we can really see a significant turnaround. Another day, another coral. <laughs>